backtrack a bit. Hello everyone. <laughs> Glad you could make it this morning uh, on this last day of Drupalcom. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for coming. We're going to be presenting content creation and verification with Selenium and Python. So we are Mobomo. We are a DevOps agency focused on creating uh, elegant solutions to solve complex problems. We work with federal agencies like NASA, the White House, and the Navy uh, to commercial organizations like Gallup, Lesset, and USO. Hello, my name is Anderson. I'm a quality assurance engineer from Obomo. Um, I work on a few of our federal projects. I'm in charge of manual testing and automation testing. Um, I'm very passionate about automation testing. I'm always researching new ways to improve our automation processes at Mobomo and uh, new tools, um, especially if they're open source. I'm very passionate about Drupal development also. I'm currently on track to a more development-based role in the future at Mobomo. And hopefully we'll be doing a more development-based presentation next year at, at GovCon. Um, in my free time, I love exercising and playing video games. <laughs> And my name is Eduardo Mariaga. I'm uh, the QA lead for Mobomo. I actually live in Buenos Aires, Argentina. If anyone knows. And, oh, sorry. Um, my job in Mobomo is to improve the whole automation process and uh, the proactive processes like, through the company itself. And on my free time, I like playing outside with my, with my dogs. I have two greyhounds and a Bernese mountain dog. And I do play soccer a lot, which we call football. But Soccer a lot. <laughs> so why I present this topic? Uh, content creation and verification is CMS specific, therefore it's Drupal specific. Um, it involves a lot of functions um, that you know can break um, at certain points, and it's very important to have them covered in your regression suite. Um, filling out backend node forms with Selenium can be really tricky. Um, any Drupal sites can have modules, uh, HTML wrappers that. Um, Selenium is going to have a hard time finding and manipulating, um, so we're going to, in the next slides, um, offer some suggestions on how you overcome certain automation roadblocks within those backend node forms. And also, we all know how uh, content creation takes up a lot of time, especially if on each deployment you lose the previous content, so having that process automated means that you can move forward more quickly, and um, also being uh, having content created each time you get a release done means that you can showcase or work on content that is up to date. So what is Selenium? Um, some people might not know, some of you may know, um, but it's an open source automation testing suite for web apps across different browsers and platforms. Um, it's kind of like a robot that can manipulate a browser um, like a person can, um, almost but not quite. Um, it also allows performing these automation, automated actions with, in a browser via script. So we have to basically write a script to tell this robot, aka Selenium, what to do. Um, it's all open source. If you visit this URL right here, you can uh, read up on everything to download, install, and start using Selenium today if you'd like. And then uh, this sort of robot has a way of connecting to different scripts on different languages. There's a lot going on. Most common ones that everyone uses are probably Java and Python. Um, and we ourselves use Python basically for the online community it has. It has always a solution for most problems and there's a lot to read about to get workarounds and stuff fixed. Um, and basically how this works is uh, you have these bindings that actually work with the driver, with the Selenium driver to contact the browser. So your scripts in Python get translated into these actions that the robot performs. So this is just a sample GIF that we made. Um, we wrote a sample script uh, just navigating to the content uh, creation verification uh, presentation on Drupal GovCon. Um, and if you're not using a headless browser, this is what it looks like. Um, it's literally doing what the user would do. It's just really fast. Um, so to anybody that isn't familiar, familiar with this, this is actually what it does. And this is the actual sample script that gets that done. This is a quick go, going over just what we're going to be talking about. But basically this script, as you can see, is very repetitive. It's not very efficient. It's a bit difficult to follow if you're not used to code Python language. Um, and basically what we're going to try and do here 
is provide a way to handle this uh, sort of structure more efficiently or with a couple of different things that make it the whole thing easier. So uh, as I said before, our basic goal is to organize this stuff. So what we use is a Gherkin layer language. So Ger Gherkin language is a layer actually, sorry. Um, that, that's basically um, a tool for behavioral driven testing in our case, but uh, what it does is it has files within the natural language called feature files that help organize this sort of steps and actions within the, the actual Selenium site, the Selenium robot. So um, in this way we can get organized more clear scripts and understand what actually this entitles. So this is what a feature file looks like. Um, it's plain English, really easy to understand. Um, there's a lot of things going on there, um, like uh, you know string parameters and some words that you need to start these steps with, and we'll go over that in the future slides. Um, this is what your test is going to look like in your console output. Um, it'll show you which steps passed. If there's an error, that text will be read, and it's going to show that corresponding Python error message within that step, so it's very easy to read um, when you're trying to figure out what's going on with your, um, your lettuce script. And if we go into the specifics of it, how it works, you basically have a one-to-one -one relationship between each statement in natural language and an actual, uh, an actual function that gets executed at Python with Python code. So this is what I meant by having a Gherkin layer, or lettuce layer in our case, on top of Python core, where you trigger Python act, Python scripts with natural language in the ledger layer, if it makes any sense. Um, here you can also see that you can pass certain information from one layer to the other. Um, just wanted to mention that out because it's gonna be brought up later in the presentation. So that uh, Python script that Eduardo was talking about a couple slides back, this is what it looks like if Lettuce were involved, um, you can see it's much more organized. You can see which grouping of Python code is associated with each step. Um, basically, um, the feature file is looking for the exact verbatim step within your Python file. So if it's looking at given I navigate to the URL with a certain string parameter, it's going to execute that step, it's going to pass through that string parameter, and then it's going to go through um, the Python code there. So um, we're basically going to um, showcase uh, parts of an example script that we're working on with one of our federal clients. It's a Drupal 7 uh, website, but you can use all of these uh, methods that we're going to talk about on Drupal 8. It's still going to be relevant. Um, so first, we're going to talk about the action we need to automate. Um, we're going to talk about a code snippet. And then um, we're going to have some useful notes and very useful notes uh, depending on what step we're talking about. Some steps are going to be, um, we're going to need to explain more than others. Um, so this is basically a common case in Drupal everyday testing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is what our finished product is going to look like. Um, this is a content type on um, the website that, that I was talking about. Um, and we're basically going to manipulate the backend note fields, uh, input all this information, and it's going to look like this at the end. Um, we're going to take a picture of it, and we're going to um, present it to uh, the client and um, for anybody else that, that needs to see the, um, the end product. Um, so we're going to go over um, basically three scenarios. In Lettuce, you have scenarios that you um, used to organize your tests. Um, the first one's going to be create content. This is going to be by far the most complex one. Um, we're going to go uh, deep into this. Um, the second scenario, verify content, take the screenshot. Uh, this one's pretty simple, but it does uh, require further explanation. Third scenario, delete content. This is optional. If you want to leave your node there in your, in your uh, environment, that's completely fine. But if you want to run the test, delete it, that's an option also. And good practice. Yes, good practice also. So before we begin, uh, Lettuce is configured by a file named terrain.py. You're going to see, um, if anyone in here is familiar with Selenium and Python, you probably see some variables in here that um, don't look like they're referenced in the Python script. That's because they're being referenced 
in this train.py file, this is what Lettuce uses to um, basically use uh, reference variables and um, additional configuration like screen resolution, um, if you're using a headless browser, um, other requirements and uh, post actions are there as well. So um, yeah, don't, don't get confused if you don't see anything that's not directly referenced in the, in the Python script. Um, Lettuce is open source as well, so you can download that um, also and start using that today with Selenium if you'd like. So create content. Um, we're going to navigate to the target website, obviously, uh, log in, <clears throat> navigate to the create page of a desired content type, enter all the required and desired information, and then save it. This is exactly how you, a person would do it, you know, if you wanted to actually exactly. create the content. So for every letter scenario, we have to start out with a given. We have to basically give it um, some conditions uh, for the test to start. So given I navigate to the site, um, and this is just a relative path that we're using against the, the base environment URL. Um, <clears throat> and then if anybody's familiar with um, Selenium and Python, this is just a basic um, uh, dot .git um, commands where you are just navigating to um, the desired website. And here's where that part came up. Because you have this layering system, information gets from Leches to Python, and the important thing is that they have to, you know, be synchronized between each other. You can either use absolute uh, URLs on the Leches step, you have to handle absolute URLs on the Python step. Uh, if you go with relative, you know, it, it needs to be synchronized for it to work correctly. So, um, the next step, log in to your Drupal site. Um, I'm just going to do a then I log in as an admin. Uh, you can use then and and for the um, following steps after that given statement. It doesn't really matter which one you use. Um, personally, I like to use then, and then when there's um, like a supplement step, I'll use an and, um, but it doesn't really matter. <coughs> it's is going to read it the same way. Um, so I'm going to create um, a username and password string. Um, always keep this um, information secure. Um, we're not going to be going into practices on how to do that, but I just want to stress that because it's, you know, password and username information. Um, so this Python step, basically we're just finding the fields um, by ID. Pretty simple. Um, with any text field in Drupal, send keys is going to be, um, you know, more than enough. We're going to go over some examples in the future slides of when that's not going to be enough. Um, so after we send the strings to our uh, username and password fields, we're just going to find that submit button and click it. And we stepped in this because uh, we stopped in this for a bit longer because it's a very common case to keep logging out and in of the Drupal platform if you have different roles and user types. So this is very common, a very common case. And once you do this, the next steps are probably just interacting with the backend to create content. Um, so this is like, will will show up in every admin that admin panel that has some sort of security on it. And uh, one one additional thing is, uh, since you're managing passwords and user password combinations, you should make sure that any sensitive information is kept uh, in a secure location. Uh, not only just passwords, any type of secure secure information. Uh, so um, the next step is to navigate to uh, your desired content type, and you're basically just going to um, you know click on create content and then you know pick your content type. Um, as you can see, there's two different click uh, steps. One is um, not generic, and the other is generic. Um, the first one, I'm finding the toolbar link by an ID and just clicking on it. I um, also want to note that um, for a lot of government websites, you have to um, switch to an alert and a government alert and accept it. Um, you'll have um, you know, a certain government message that will appear. Um, I'm not sure it's, if it's different for every government website, but I know the one that we're working on always pops up, so um, that's how you take care of that. Um, the next click action is generic. I can pass, you know, we have probably 20 content types on our site. So I can use this over and over again and just pass through, you know, whatever, um, you know, string I need to that corresponds with another content type, so I don't need to write that again. Um, and within that step, um, 
I am able to put in that string into the X path and um, just use a simple click and then we're on to the next page. Perfect. And um, I just want to mention that we're going to go over this probably in, a, in the future, but in a future slide. But there's very different ways you can interact with objects using uh, ledges and actually Python. Um, so any action can be handled very differently. There's a lot of different ways to get to the same result. Um, and in this, like two different click steps, you can see that the, the main difference between them is that one is more generic than the other meaning that you can pass a value and it helps navigate to the different content types instead of doing something very specific. As a general rule, it's a good idea to make this uh, ledger steps as generic as possible to be able to reuse them and avoid code repetition. Uh, once you make a step, you can call it as much, as much times as you want on the ledger file. So then we need to um, enter all the required and desired information. This is where it gets pretty tricky. Um, we're just going to take um, a few example steps out of this lettuce script, um, and we're going to go into them and discuss um, you know, what are the problems that we encountered and how we overcame those issues. And we didn't go into e detail on each step, because every platform is going to be different. It depends on how Drupal uh, what Drupal modules you're using and how it's set up. It's different from project to project. So the idea is to, as, as Anderson said, go through the problems that we found with a couple of these that were interesting to showcase. Um, but basically, what, as I mentioned, once you log in, the idea is to just go into the form and start creating content by finding element and interacting with them. That's the basic principle. So um, the first code snippet that we're look, looking at is uh, just a basic drop-down list. Um, this is how I tackle drop-down lists. I just find it by ID. Um, anytime I, I click on a drop-down list, it's usually going to work. There are some cases where you're going to have to uh, tell Selenium to actually hover over it and click it or do some other things um, that, that Selenium can do. Um, with Drop-down elements, I like to use custom XPaths. Um, I like to just grab the, the tag name um, and then use this basic um, basic XPath to uh, put in a string so I can find um, you know whichever item out of the drop-down list I want. Um, if you go and try to copy an XPath out of a drop-down list, it's sometimes not going to appear like this. Um, I feel like this is the most effective. Um, and then I'm just going to click on it using a simple Selenium click and it's good to go. Um, the next one, um, this is another send keys example. Like I said before, this is going to work at most text fields um, in your site. Um, and yeah. And so uh, basically here we're using the click action. It will work 90% of the times. Uh, it's, it's super straightforward. Uh, but there are times where that will not work. Uh, for different reasons, a click might not be triggering the action that you expect. So um, we're going to be handling a couple of different uh, ideas on how to fix it, but um, a good way of targeting elements to actually click on the one you like to click is uh, using XPath and CSS selectors. We're going to go over a couple of different uh, ways of using those that are pretty Import pretty straightforward, the most common cases, but it's very important when someone is using this type of tool that he has some uh, advanced knowledge and how to target things using XPath and CSS selectors. They're the, they're the, like the go-to tool if you're having trouble to find stuff. Um. So um, we're gonna, going to go over an example of when um, a dot click <coughs> does not work. Um, as any, anybody that has been dealing with Selenium for a long time knows, you can do a JavaScript click. Um, this is not the best thing to do all the time because it doesn't exactly emulate what the user would do, but it is a way to get over necessary roadblocks to get this content creation and verification process um, solidified. Um, so we have a uh, scout module on our site. I don't know if you, any of you are familiar with that module, but it's um, like a pullout that holds all of the atoms in your site, and you can drag and drop it into uh, relevant fields. Um, so the button for this uh, scout module is actually a div. Um, you, you're rarely going to use Selenium to click on a div element with a dot click. 
Um, but after, you know, probably a couple hours of trying to figure out how this works, maybe not a couple, maybe like an hour, but it was still a long time. Um, I'm using this execute script command, which we're gonna go more into after this, but this is kind of an intro introduction to execute script. This is like the way to overcome any limitation that you encounter um, with Selenium. Um, it's a basic JavaScript injection. Um, but with this, it's not too complicated. You're just kind of following a, a simple click command, uh, targeting the element, um, and you know that that method should work if your dot clicks don't work. Um, the next step, um, we're going to go into um, explicit weights. Um, this is a complicated step, and it's going to be kind of hard for me to describe what it looks like. But basically, we need to wait for a certain element to appear. Um, if you look at time.sleep up in the first snippet, that's an implicit wait. Uh, that's not the most efficient. Um, you can do that if it you know, can't be avoided. Uh, in that case, it couldn't be avoided. Um, but in a lot of cases, you can use an explicit wait to uh, maximize the efficiency of your test. Um, you can set a maximum amount of time that it'll, it'll wait, and then and it'll once it finds that element, then it'll continue the test after that. And that's what um, the first line in the second snippet, add existing contact and contact, and then the last line contact table. Those are all explicit weights. Um, and then in the middle, I used um, some send keys to actually navigate a certain drop-down list because um, sometimes with autocomplete fields, you can't use a selenium.click on those. So I had to use send keys to manually um, choose those uh, elements out of the drop-down list. <clears throat> and um, someone that did not actually follow everything, it's fine. I mean, no one needs to know exactly what's going on. But basically, um, there's just two things that we can gather from this as a general experience when you get hands-on this type of tool. Uh, basically, there's just a difference here with the weights. One is an explicit, and the other one is an implicit weight. Uh, sometimes uh, having a fixed amount of period of weight is not avoidable. There's nothing that you can hook onto and make sure that it's present before you continue to do a more efficient weight. Um, and they just can't be avoided. Uh, you might try a couple of times, but if not, there's just uh, sometimes there's just no workaround behind it. Uh, it might hurt some performance, but it needs to happen. There's no other way of, of going at it. And um, then if you just compare those and follow with some previous one, you can see that uh, you can get the Python steps as complex as possible. As com actually, as complex as you want, it, they should be as simple as possible, but they can get really complex and they are hidden be behind the actual ledger step. So from the, let's say, person looking at the feature file, he w won't actually see what's actually going on on the Python script. Um, he will get an idea of what it does, but it, it, it hides complexity. That's the whole idea. It hides the complexity in the Python core. <coughs> So this is going to be um, an example of um, kind of an interesting JavaScript injection. Um, when we say JavaScript injection, um, we're talking about Selenium referring to the JavaScript that's on the page, and you're literally just you know, injecting the JavaScript um, into the page and um, referring to what's already on the page. Um, so we're going to enter some test intro text into a CK editor. Um, I know many. Drupal sites have a CK editor. It's a very like universal tool. And basically, this is what we refer as JavaScript injection. It's basically just pulling the console on the browser and writing stuff. I don't know if anyone has does it, but it's just how it works. It's having a backdoor to that console in the browser. And although it's 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 a very strong tool, you can get almost anything done using this way. You're just uh, stepping aside from the behavioral testing part because you're doing something that a user will probably not do, right? So it is a workaround for very complex flows that cannot be triggered by using the other more common tools. It, it most of the times, 99.9% .9 of the time works, but it should be used as a last resort. So, um when I was talking about sending keys earlier, um, this is where it did not work. Um, I also tried a lot of um, other methods, um, including 
using Selenium to switch to a CK Editor iframe and sending that text to the body tag. And for the project I was working on, that just did not work. Anything I tried just did not work. Um, so I did some research and CK Editor has an API, um, and this is just an API call. Um, I'm just sending text uh, to that field name. Um, CKEditor.instances is, is a JavaScript array. <clears throat> you can use um, the console on your browser um, to literally put CKEditor.instances. It's going to return all those fields. Um, for our project, we had like 12 different CK editors on a, a certain content type. Um, so I used that to um, figure out what the name was, put the name in. Um, dot set data is going to input that text. Um, this API call also can take an HTML. <clears throat> so I wanted to test the different CK editor buttons rather than trying to click on each CK editor button and you know enter the text that way, which most likely was not going to work. I made a separate HTML file, um, or we made a separate HTML file with the corresponding tags for the buttons. Um, so bold, strong, uh, italics, M, um, anchor tag for the link. Um, Superscript, subscripts, um, pretty simple, but um, you know, trying to press on the CK editor buttons can get pretty, pretty complicated. Um, so I just, we just wrote a function um, to read this file into a string, um, and it lit it's literally a string and goes into that API call, and um, we'll we'll show you the end result again. We showed it to you in the beginning, but it it spits out, um, you know, the. Um, the generated uh, text. Um, the thing to look at is the test. Everything says test intro text. That, that's going to come up. Yes. Um, this is another um, comp complicated JavaScript injection that we um, we had actually had to work with one of our developers on our team. We're you know QA engineers, um, but we're not um, developers. So we had to reach out to um, a, a very talented developer on, on our team to kind of get this to work. Um, this is basically when I was talking about that scout module um, before. Uh, this is dragging and dropping one of those atoms um, into the thumbnail field. Um, Selenium dragging and drop never really works in my experience. Um, you can use some other methods like uh, holding the mouse down with Selenium moving it to a certain coordinate in the page and letting the mouse go. Uh, that just did not work. So what I'm doing is I'm looking for any image that contains a test Anderson image. Um, for any QA engineers out there, if you're doing any sort of manual testing, I definitely recommend that you have some sort of formula with your uh, test content that you name it a certain way. Um, just makes this whole process easier. Um, and I get the data atom ID. So now I you know, have some information for this atom that I can use in this JavaScript command. Um, basically what we're doing is assigning this image atom to drupal.dnd.currentAtom. Then we're using this jQuery um, command to trigger a drop. Um, we're not dragging and dropping like a user would, so this is definitely a last resort, but it, it was something that we just, you know, it was, it was something that we had to do. It was, we had no other solution, um, and it you know populates the, the field immediately. But you're not going to see that image like going across the page or anything like that. Um, and then you just execute that um, with the execute script commands. And uh, as, Anderson, as Anderson mentioned, sorry, um, drag and drops are not user friendly for this tool. In fact, uh, you know, we did a presentation on the whole drag and drop thing on Drupal, and it's no, no it's always a bad choice. Uh, but especially for testing with this type of tooling, drag and drop is very hard to actually implement. So you always end up with this workarounds. And um, as as we as a as a common practice, if you're involved in any sort of technical decision and you have a say on it and there's an option to not go drag and drop way, try to not go that way because it's, it's not going to be pretty. Um, you're going to probably struggle to see how it works and most of the times it ends up in this JavaScript injection and it's not even then pretty because you have to contact a developer to get it working. Perhaps they need to add some code to actually have it work. Um, so it's, it's an added effort to the whole thing.
So then we're just going to simply save the node. Um, like um, a few other steps in the past, I'm just going to find that button by ID. That's usually the simplest way to do it, and click it. Um, you're most likely not going to do have to do anything else. Eduardo is going to talk about um, some other things that you might need to watch out for, but usually this is uh, sufficient. So, well, basically, um, in most, in some cases, not in most cases, but some, in some cases, for the changes to actually impact the content part of the of the platform, you need to either wait a certain amount of time or trigger some cron if it's available, some automated process that fishes out any changes, any changes, and applies them to the actual site. So, um, basically you need to handle those situations where you need the changes that you've just made to impact the actual page or whatever you're creating uh, because you're gonna probably test them in the next scenario. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, notice how when we save the node the actual code, you might not remember it, but the code itself is the same as when you're submitting your login information, like the code itself is the same, but Remember that everything is state dependent. So right now we're on a form screen and we're clicking on a button, button that has the same ID but it's on a different page. So sometimes ledger steps refer to this different states but the code is the same, um, which means that you need to pay attention to the flow of where, where you are at before going forward. Now we're going to go through the, the second step, which comes after. That's basically verifying that what we created is what we wanted to create, or how it should look like. So we just need to follow the same procedure, just you know, finding elements um, and interacting with them. Um, this scenario right here is actually independent from the first one. You could tweak this to make it de dependent, so it just runs. Um, but with Lettuce, you can execute um, different scenarios uh, independently from each other. Um, so we're going to navigate to the site again, log in, um, navigate to the URL of that specific node, um, and then we're going to verify that the content is there. And notice that that's just one step, and we're going to go into um, the complexity of that step in the next slide. So if anyone that's used Selenium before is very familiar with these element locators, um, you use certain ones for certain situations. Um, so definitely use your expertise and discretion when you're using these selectors. Um, you can get you know, super specific and complex with this verification, like verifying that um, certain HTML uh, text elements appear in like a paragraph or something like that, or you know, making sure that an element, element um, an image appears, an uh, image element. Um, so it really depends on what you're trying to verify and um, you know, what, what your client wants to verify, for example, if, if, if you want to get the client involved in this sort of process. Well, basically, you can just um, see the requirements and see what, what needs to be tested, trying to narrow it down, because you can basically target everything within the page. So you need to make sure that you're efficient at it, because if not, it becomes sort of counterproductive to go through everything. But these are like the main ways to target different elements within a page. And um, basically, we wanted to show the entire list. As we mentioned, the most, let's say, resourceful ones are XPath and CSS. Uh, those are the ones that get more complex inputs and are the ones that will get the job done whenever there's not a more direct way to approach it, like with an ID or with probably a, a name, a specific name that was put into a certain object by the development team. Um, also, I want to go over the screenshot uh, with Chrome Driver. Um, you can use Save Screenshot to take a screenshot. It's going to save it to the the folder, the folder where the Selenium uh, tests are located. Um, you can also configure that to uh, go to another folder if you want. Um, but with Chrome Driver, you do need to um, set the browser width and the browser height before you do take a screenshot. Because if you just do save screenshot with Chrome, um, it's just going to take a picture of the viewport. You're not going to get the whole page. Delete content. 
So same process. Um, there's many ways to do this. Um, also many ways to verify that it actually is deleted. Um, but we're just going to simply, um, this is an example of a dependent scenario. This is dependent on the, on the last one. Given that, that we're on that URL, um, we're just going to click new draft or edit in some cases. Click delete. Um, sometimes there's a confirm deletion if you want to confirm it. And then you can um, hit that button. It's usually just a submit button. Um, and then if you want to go even further, you can um, try to navigate to that URL again and make sure you get a 404. Or you can go to your content, um, your content view and make sure that that node does not appear anywhere there. Um, and there's other ways to do it as well. Yeah, it's uh, there's very different ways to approach how it is deleted. Sometimes uh, the content is actually published and you get it unpublished, but it's not completely deleted. It just goes through these different stages. So make sure, you, you know, part of testing is just testing that the content can be correctly managed, and that includes content deletion or unpublishing content. It's part of the process as well. So documentation is super important. Um, this with a lot of information to pack in. Um, if you don't organize and document this, um, then you're going to get lost. You know, you're going to try to read these Python scripts, and um, you're just going to be like, "Okay, where is the stuff I'm looking for? Like, we implemented this. Uh, we got to include this in the suite. You know, you got to keep that in a plain language document for everybody to see." Um, so you got to document the lettuce steps and what they do. Um, that's very important. Even though lettuce is, it's very easy to read. It's Gherkin. You still got to document it in a corresponding, um, just plain language document. Um, element selectors and verify content. This is super duper important, especially when you, if you want to get really specific with your uh, element selectors. Um, it can be very easy to get lost when you look at a Python script and all these different lines, and each line is like locating an element, and you're trying to like figure out what to do. Um, also, what works and doesn't for certain steps. Um, you know, if you're doing automation and you've tried a bunch of different things for um, a certain task that you um, were able to solve, you want to uh, put those things that you tried in a document so other people that are trying to automate simi similar tasks know uh, what didn't work and what works for um, that certain uh, problem. Exactly. And just a side note, this is by no means the entire set of documentation for the project. Uh, there are still going to be test plans and all other sources of documentation, but these are the key things that need to be included for the next guy that comes in because he's not going to know the whole process that took you to create that code and that structure. So he might roll back or try stuff again to make it work better without knowing that it, you tried it and it did not work. So the idea is to keep the communication there, keep the information directly where it needs to be to make this pro process more agile, having someone aboard it and working on it as fast as possible. That, that's the idea of this documentation. Um, so basically what happens next? You already have a way to automate the creation process, a way to verify that the content is there, but uh, you know you want to go and get this whole thing a bit further and add it to, this, to a CI environment or have it executed automatically on certain periods of, of time or be with, with some triggers regarding on project changes. Um, so basically the good, the good thing about having this Kirking and Selenium solution is that it's um, it's, it gets a lot of different plugins and there's a, a lot of platforms that support this sort of structure. So um, there's a lot of tools right now that support this, um, this Gherking type languages. Um, same thing happens with Docker. You can actually turn this whole tool into a Docker image and run it as you would with any container. We're not going to go specifically about containers, but I just wanted to mention that in most CI, development CI processes, they use containers. And this is a tool that can easily be translated into a container. It's, it's out there, it's very easy to get Docker files to get it done, and it's super straightforward. And um, the good, uh, good thing of having this CI integration is that you then have a way to centralize all the results. They will be available to anyone that can access that CI platform. And it can also showcase a trend of how it evolved through time. So you get not only the, the test results, but the trend of how it went. Yeah. So um, basically, uh, as I mentioned, the idea is to add this results to the CI environment to track which test passed and didn't. Um, it states trackability. Uh, you can get plugins 
that actually um, go through the reporting part of it and um, basically you get all the login it's it's basically just running the test in an environment that show, allows you to execute them automatically and then go afterwards and see what happened um, and after you're done you get this sort of reporting section that Anders is going to explain briefly. Yeah, so with Jenkins, um, this alert report is a plugin you can use. Um, we're going to show that in one of the future slides. Um, and we're um, almost close to getting wrapped up, so we're going to try to push this through. Um, available steps for the project. You, uh, there we have an HTML page where we showcase all of the steps for, for each uh, scenario so the client and the rest of the team can look at them in a very um, you know, readable space. Um, this is where our screenshots are going to go for the, the verification um, and if you want to export the screenshot and show it to the client in another way that's fine, um, you can also just give them the URL and access to um, your Jenkins um, environment. Also latest test result is just going to show your latest test result and these just are coming, with the exception of a Lure report, this is all out of the box. So this is what our um, content looks like. Um, and as you can see, the CK editor um, intro text is appearing um, like it should. Um, and the body field as well is the same, same thing, but um, less amount of uh, HTML tags. Um, but everything's looking great, and we're ready to show this to the client and the rest of the team. And this is basically the reports that you can get out of the platform with the default plugins. This is Allure. Uh, it's very easy to configure, actually. You just have to have the, the, the result files that Latches actually generates when it runs into a specific folder and then just target it with a plugin. There's just one thing that you need to tell him to actually generate these reports. It will actually automatically keep track of the different times it run and the results to generate graphs for our own time. And it can also be configured to actually separate features by themselves and see which ones are passing or not, uh, assign complexity and, uh, sorry, assign severity to different tests to make sure that critical tests are passing all the time and you can allow some trivial tests to actually fail without any sort of, like warning system to them. Um, basically, what we've all shown here is a Jenkins CI tool. The Jenkins CI tool. We use Jenkins because it's pretty straightforward to set up. Um, it's just basically running a, a, a Java file and it will just get everything going. Uh, e it has a lot of support, but there's different plugins and obviously Gherkin languages support, like Leches, there's also Cucumber, there's a lot going on there, but it supports everything. And um, basically, uh, it allows you to do the whole thing that we just showcased pretty simply. Um, if anyone wants to go, go and ahead and read more, there's the page to Jenkins. It has a lot of useful documentation and a great community as well to learn how to do this stuff. So our summary, uh, using a behavior-driven development tool like Selenium and Lettuce allows you to organize and scale your test bank. Um, natural language means all parties understand the test and helps in test-driven development environments. Um, and not all automation in Drupal is straightforward. We talked a lot about um, how to overcome certain automation roadblocks. So gathering results from behavioral testing is very straightforward. There's a lot of plugins for it. it it's easily integrated into a CI tool. Uh, there's, there's a lot of ways to get this done. There's a lot of documentation, different ways to do it. Uh, this is just one example, but you can tailor it as, as you would want. It's very valuable. Um, the idea behind this being running, it, running the test in a continuous manner, which is sometimes difficult, and perhaps even outside of your computer in a different place, so you, it's not dependent on you being at the computer at all times. And then the good thing is that it still has a way to expose results and give the, the Q engineer the tools to go to the uh, logs, see what happens, see what step failed, get the track back to see if it's a problem with the project itself or with the tool. The tools are there, but you're not so worried about having to execute them all the time yourself. It's in the CI process. So I know this was a lot, but if there are any questions, uh, we have some more minutes to target them. Perfect, yeah. Um, so just to uh, understand how you start 
my understanding is I don't use Selenium myself, but the, it kind of acts as a macro like you know, record yeah. session. Is, is that how you guys start those scripts in the very beginning? No. no. Everything by hand? So or? Selenium has an IDE yeah. um, for Firefox, right? Um, and there's like some other recording tools. You can do that. You can actually use that in uh, conjunction with Selenium if you want to get started. Um, but you know, if you know how to write um, Selenium code, it's you know, much easier because you can, um, you know, write custom code that's probably better sometimes than recording the script. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if Selenium, like a recording tool, could even record that drag and drop correctly. Like it doesn't know that JavaScript code to do that. You know. So, so that's a. It's like going a level deeper. Uh, this is this is using something called Selenium Web Drivers, and you have bindings to different type of codes. So, for example, the Java binding, Python Web binding, and how it works is it actually leads. It, it lets you tap into the automation that is already built into the browser. So, browsers when they started, you know, getting fancier, they added automation properties to them to actually allow, for example, Chrome to test its own browser and then they realized there was a use case for this and they actually release and maintain these web drivers that are the way to tap into that functionality that is already in the browser right so every browser has its own way of driver and it's maintained by the browser itself the browser company let's say firefox has its browser uh, internet explorer let's not talk about internet explorer <laughs> chrome has its driver and so on and so forth um, yeah, so Safari so is not that great either, but um, the idea being that this is the way we tap into it, so it allows you to target everything basically that you want inside the browser. So picture what you're saying, that you record actions by the user. The user is clicking at a given point within the page. Now, some way the software that you're using, should it be IDE or some other platform like Ghost Inspector, which is another good way of doing that. Um, will trigger a click on that specific spot, but you might as well, when you run it again, uh, be capturing the click on a different element that will receive it, so it will break, right? And uh, beside it, it almost all the times records expats, and you know, absolute expats are completely unreadable. It's very difficult to actually understand what you're clicking if you see like the DOM tree nesting path to the actual object you're clicking because it's not going to use names, IDs, things that are more easy to find. So it's, it's a good first, I, good first step into this, but once you get and tap into this way of actually managing what you're doing with the browser yourself, um, the tool itself gets way more useful. Yes? At what point do you kick off these tests? Like what's the trigger? Well, you can start them as early as you want in the practice process. Um, the thing is you need to have something to act upon. So if there's only, for example, just backend, there's no uh, front end or something you can break up in a browser, it's fairly difficult, or at least it's not meant to be used that way. You can still target the API using Python code and let your steps. But that's sort of like a different presentation because uh, that won't be behavioral testing. Uh, you have to actually have a browser with some sort of page built on it with minimal functionality that you are going to test and then start your way up. The good thing, sorry, just one more thing because um, you can go with the project as it evolves because if you, for example, do a, start working and the first thing that your development team actually does is the login process and you get that uh, coded like on the first week or so, that will sort of follow the project while it, it, it gets developed. It's not some work that will be used just on the first period of the development process. Does that make sense? So you it's more in terms of like the workflow. Do you do this on a weekly basis? Do you do this on a um, weekly basis? So from, like from our experience, um, we have our uh, Jenkins regression suite set up. So um, for our staging environments and production environments, um, my, I myself will, um, before we uh, deploy to prod, I'll <coughs> run regressions and staging, <clears throat> and then you know uh, write tickets for anything I find or um, you know whatever whatever that needs to be documented. Um, you know once I verify that staging is good and the client verifies staging is good. Um, we'll deploy to prod. Um, after deployment, we'll run regressions 
and then deal with whatever comes after that. Yeah. Have you looked at uh, kicking this off at, like, let's say there's a, a DevOps workflow for specifically checking into a specific branch and then using mm -hmm. that as a trigger? Um, yeah. Actually, that's that's actually very interesting. I'm currently not using it on my project. I'm not sure. If yeah, I am. That. We are. Um, it can be done. It's not that complicated. The problem is you need to be sort of doing some TDD because you're triggering stuff uh, for testing. Just oh. presenting. Oh, sorry. But yeah, finish, finish up. Real Just the last one. So um, basically what you need to do is work with the dev team to make sure that both things are on the same page because if not, if you haven't updated the test yet, it will fail, but it's not a fail because it's just that it's not done. So when you have TDD, you have to sort of start communicating more strongly with the dev team. And uh, just 